Here we up, Paul and Peyton are here. I'm spending a lot of time doing all the intricate little areas and I'm going to have to paint over it or paint over some of it and change it. I like to leave in the whole process though. Um, you know, there are some great artists who don't tend to make too many mistakes. <laughs> They've got a really good vision and the great drafts people as well, so. Um, but I'd rather leave my mistakes in be because if you're a person who's not as confident, you might be thinking that you know, artists, they just don't make mistakes and things. But I think it, if you're struggling yourself and you, you see an artist leaving things in that they've had to correct, I think it makes you feel better, really. That even though they're a great artist, they're, they're not perfect and they're not like a machine that does, never does anything wrong. I couldn't resist going back to that here. So that kind of side of his face there is really is moving away from the light. So I suppose it's going so dark and it'll look darker than it actually is just because I'm painting on a white canvas. It'll make it, might make it look too dark, but once all the paint's on, you can see it all in context then. Now I'm thinking about the form of the face again, so where his cheekbones are there, as the curves around it's because it's curved, it's more light hitting it.
pain under his cheekbone on the on the right side of his face, so where it's created a bit of shadow. And then the next part will be kind of on top of the cheekbone, so it'll be lighter, that'll be hit, catching the light. Also, the, the part between his nose and the uh, the right side of his face, the tip of his nose, it's kind of the area where it's fallen away from the light, so it goes a bit darker as you come down. I'm just looking at the different features as well that's left to paint on his face from um, where his cheek and nostril meet, so that little fold there and the, the filter under his nose. When you paint around the mouth as well, you've got to remember that the shape there as well, that it's from um, near the bottom of the nose down to under his um, under his lips, uh, his bottom lip. You could kind of draw a circle around there and that's kind of um, 
like a mound, um, you know, protruding in that area as well. So just as with the eye or with a sphere, even round the mouth and down to the chin, you got to kind of think in of the of the you know the sphere-like structure there as well. And all these little things like that that people a lot of people don't realise is that's what creates surrealism. And if, if you're interested in painting realistic portraits. Yeah, as his cheek turns away into um, more of a shadow at the bottom there on the uh, the right side. So the cheek at the bottom comes out a bit because um, Dylan's a little overweight. Um, so it's coming out from that. Um, The, the circular, the structure from on his jaw, from his nose to his his chin. So so the his cheek is kind of extending out from there. So it's going to hit more light in that, that area there. I should say more light's going to hit that. It's good to think about the structure of a person's face as you're painting or drawing. And towards one of those darker areas down at the, on, around his chin. He's 
got a little cleft in his chin as well. Like a little a dimple thing. Then there's another um, sphere shape at, at the bottom where his chin is, so kind of coming down in um, spheres really from his uh, jaw area, then down to another smaller sphere around on his, his chin. Knowing those kind of things help you in your drawing because you can always lightly draw a circle where you, where you know these um, sphere structures are on, on a person's face. They kind of help you um, yeah they kind of help you get the um, the proportions get get your landmarks in the right kind of area. Yes, yeah, so a real strong shadow under his uh, bottom lip because his lip comes out quite far. And each stage, each painting stage is a setup for the next one. So even though I'm not using colour in this um, stage for the underpainting, it's still giving me the opportunity to get to know the uh, the features and the, the structure of Dylan's face. So when I do come to do the, the colour, it would kind of be um, integrated into me a, a bit and it'll make it a little bit easier for decisions I've got to make on the uh, second painting stage. I'll be thinking of that structure around his mouth now. 
as it curves away in that sphere, going down towards the corner of his mouth, would be going darker. The more paint you get on, the more areas you can see that might need tweaking around. Like I was just going back to his nose again. And then that light hitting by the side of the nostril as the form of the, um, the face there um, turns away. But as it turns away, obviously the the top of it like a billiard ball would be more like hitting it that's why it's lighter by the nostril and get the um, his left cheek painted in now so that's more in the shade shadow area It's nice when you get all the paint on and then you're thinking then you know about his shirt and his bow tie and his jacket and yeah, get the paint on those you know it's going to dry pretty quick because you use quick drying paint so um, then you kind of can't wait to get on to painting the the flesh tones in You can see there, as I'm painting his cheek, I'm still putting paint on quite thick just to give a good grounding for when I put the, uh, the colour on, just so the paint flows across it a lot easier. Kind of rubbing it in there, scrubbing it into the canvas. Yeah, if you, if you paint like that, you use um, durable paint brushes. Don't use uh, the sables because you just ruin them. That's why I really like the ivory brushes. Yeah, if, you, if you're not sure about paint brushes, um, Rosemary's brushes, they've got a good website where you can look at all the, uh, the different brushes they do. I 
think they're based in Yorkshire. When you see a lot of really, you know, top artists, um, and you see them a lot in places like YouTube, a lot of them do use the rosemary brushes. And that's where I found out about them, just from watching other artists. But I've been buying rosemary brushes for quite a long time now. In fact, for a Christmas present, um, generally um, family members will get me vouchers for rosemary brushes, <laughs> birthday presents, Christmas presents. I'm just re-establishing some values there um, on his um, top of his cheek, on his on his right cheek, and just near by the side of his nose. Because when you're really scrubbing the painting and blending, you can lose the uh, the values that you uh, that you'd put on originally. So you can just have a tweak around with those. See, I'm not totally disciplined, so I'm just kind of seeing what he's doing in the moment. So I'm just adding those um, extra values. And now I'm finishing off. <laughs> I've just left that bit on the, the, you know, on his face at the top there, just because I got distracted by re, um, adjusting the values again. Let's get going under the chin, really shadow side there.
there will be some kind of re reflected shadow in his, under his chin. Usually, um, that's usually like a warm shadow um, bouncing up there. But with it being just a black and white photo, you, it's kind of a, a guessing game for you know a lot of these areas. When I first started painting portraits, I was just so strict. Um, that I just paint paint what what you see. But now, you know, I bit use a quite a bit of artistic license, and I'm saying that because on the side of his neck, because because Dylan is overweight, there's a strong fold of skin. But I, I don't really want to make all that thing kind of too obvious, so... I kind of was a bit more subtle with that. Be good to finish this last bit round his chin and neck and then um, get his jacket and shirt painted in and his bow tie. Just that reflection under his chin, the side there, of light, so just making sure I get that in.
Just making sure we're getting the shadows right under his chin that I don't make his chin too long. I don't have too many problems when I come to the uh, second painting. So I want to try to make sure I've got everything in the right place really. Apart from his ear. <laughs> Last part now, side of his neck. And then I can start on his clothing. Still can't resist going around his neck again and that shadow area just to try and get it as best as good as I can. Maybe we're still enjoying the music and just chilling out, doing a bit of painting, watching it. I think I might have realised that something's not quite right with that ear. So I'm just thinking maybe the, the shadow... I should really should have um, stepped back and uh, you know, stopped painting, stepped back and had a, a look from a, from a distance and I would have soon seen it but...
It's all part of the painting process. Try to get things right early on and then you don't have problems like this. <laughs> Now what the problem is because the ear it, it, the ear is too low. Anyway, it needs the whole it needs lifting up. But I've kind of was, was making it too small then by lifting the bottom up higher and not bothering with the top part of it. It kind of looks more like. Um, then if you watch Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, it kind of looks more like a, an elvish kind of ear at the moment. I do um, leave it smaller. Because um, I think time was getting on and I realised it was wrong, but if you have time, you should correct it really in this painting stage, but I kind of left it when I do the second painting to correct it. See, I'm making it way too small there. So it's funny how tricky painting can be sometimes, that Things don't look right, but sometimes everything's in proportion where it should be. But then that's just down to the shading, uh, the values, or the colours make it look different. Um, other times, like this with the ear, it's, it was in the wrong place. Um, now I've made it too small by keeping it in the same place and lifting the bottom up instead of. Um, even though I lifted the top up a little bit, but I should have just lifted the, um, you know, the whole of the ear back up. That's good. Now I'm on to the jacket. This should be uh, mostly look much quicker because 
obviously there's not too much detail on it so it's just a matter of getting the paint on really and then a little bit of values where maybe the shoulders were more light hitting it Actually, yeah, it's a bow tie I've just started there. You don't see many people wearing bow ties these days, but in Dylan's day, it must have been very popular. He did four tours of America. Uh, and that made him really um, famous in America as well whereas he, he struggled in the UK to make a living um, he did work for the BBC but he was always struggling um, to make ends meet but he kind of did finally crack it in America but unfortunately um, he with the money living until he was 39, he didn't really get a chance to you know, enjoy any money that would be coming to him. There's a bit of shadow under the end of the bow tie. Dylan's granddaughter, Hannah, she um, still visits the boathouse and she has children, so Dylan would have been a great grandfather if he was still alive. He would have been into his hundreds, so. He was still alive. Would have been a uh, hundred and six.
I like to listen to music that has a bit of a beat when I'm painting. I find it uh, gives me more energy. So something like uh, be listening to dance music or um, indie music. So if I start if I start flagging, I just put put some of that on, and it soon gets me going again. When you get near the end of doing the underpainting or any painting stage, it, it's quite nice. Um, especially if you've put a lot of time and effort into it, it's nice to get it finished and um, go and get yourself a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and uh, chill out for a bit. With painting Dylan, I, I worked till quite late for the um, underpainting and the second painting stage worked till quite late at night. So, but I um, just wanted to to uh, finish it, and as I said earlier, it's for an advertisement as well for an online art class. So I just worked it. I'm just following the form of his shoulders as well, or, or you know, the areas and painting of his jacket. Um, same principle of looking where the, the light's hitting and trying to create a bit of form there. The photograph was so bad I couldn't even see the, uh, the collar or the lapel on that side of his jacket. It was impossible to see, so I painted it a bit thin there. But um, I knew that for when I was for, for doing the second painting to correct it. Really, when you do the second painting, you don't really want to be correcting things because, especially when you're having to consider um, flesh tones and things, you know, you have a lot to think about already. So. But correcting it was, you know, obviously is a pretty simple thing. It's not like correcting an eye or something. I hope you're still with me. Hopefully if you've got um, a bit tired watching it, you can pause and get yourself a, a cup of coffee or tea and come back to it. I 
asked to do a painting, a portrait, be um, looser than this uh, Alla Prima, which we paint in one go, maybe give himself four hours and just have the whole painting process um, unedited, really, just get himself set up and, and uh, do a painting like that. But it won't be as refined as, you know, because you're on such a limited time that you do have to paint things in very loosely. Not far off finishing the jacket now, a little bit further to go, and then onto his shirt.
Good onto the shirt now. There's a little button there as well. Bit of shadow under the bit of shadow from the bow tie, so yeah, you can't really see the white paint going on the shirt because <laughs> it'd been white already or in the lightest areas anyway. Yeah, my wife's a poet, so when we moved to Wales, not far from Larne where Dylan used to live, we used to go and visit the boathouse. Um, and then I ended up getting a job there. I um, sold a, a nice painting I did of Dylan when he was younger it, at, at the boathouse and then um, I got some prints in there. So I've probably painted Dylan. Um, about four times. Including this one.
I think um, looking at this, it would have been maybe quite nice to have kept um, the painting just as a black and white painting. Seems to be a bit more keeping of the times. I have seen one old colour photo of Dylan, so in that I could see he had red hair. But, um, you know, I think practically all the photos of Dylan are black and white ones. And I don't think there's any video footage of him either, film footage. He did used to work for the BBC for a period of time, especially during the war. Because he had um, a chest condition. Um, asthma he couldn't he tried to get in, in to join the army f to fight in the second world war but um, he he couldn't get through because of medical reasons Yeah, I'm just painting the button in there. I think it's just the button and the shirt collar to paint. And then that'll be it for the underpainting. Final part now with the collar. I'm probably thinking, oh, I really need a cup of tea now. <laughs> I think you need a cup of tea as well after watching this for three hours.
Remember when we painted his hair and we're putting the dark patches in first on a white canvas and how dark it looked. Now in uh, contrast to the other areas of the portrait, kind of doesn't look so dark and looks more in um, context with everything else. When some people start painting, they when they first start putting the brush strokes on, they start worrying that oh, it looks too dark, doesn't look right. Um, but you just ignore that kind of stuff when you when you've done a few paintings, and you because you know it's gonna um, you know look okay when you've put got all the paint on. It's amazing how much work goes into a portrait, even doing an underpainting, you know, quite loose. All the areas, the, the differences in values, you know, and the details, even that shirt button. I think my camera went off at some point, I think the battery went, <clears throat> and don't think we saw it, but I was started tweaking around that but button again, and, um, I just decided to paint over it because it just wasn't looking right. But I'll paint it in in the second painting. quite hard when you're filming and painting because you've got one eye on the camera and uh, one eye on the painting and because the, obviously the batteries need changing in the camera and memory cards get full and my camera will only film for I don't know maybe 20 minutes half an hour before it turns itself off and it's all done silently so you don't know it's stopped until you look up and then you have to start it again. Anyway, um, I hope you did learn from this on the painting stage. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am painting the button in again there, but just as I'm doing that, I just uh, hope you did learn from this painting stage and. If you want to do a painting with an underpainting first, um, it's quite good to do one in black and white because it just makes it more, it simplifies the whole process. And then you could even have it, leave it as it is as a painting or do what I'm going to do and that's paint over it. You, you know, you could paint a more realistic black and white over it. Um, or if you felt confident enough, paint colour over it. 